Well, good morning. We are in uh, Proverbs chapter 23, and we are looking at these uh, sayings of the wise together. Um, it is, I count it a great privilege to be with you on these Sundays. Uh, and to prove that, I left Oklahoma City yesterday at 72 degrees. So uh, I was explaining that to a guy, and he looked at me, and his head turned this way and that way, and he said, why in the world would you come down here? <laughs> Proverbs chapter 23, uh, beginning in verse 12, is really the... 12th saying of the wise, we're not going to look at 13 and 14 because we've covered that, but I specifically want to address this uh, verse 12 because it is a real practical one for all of us. So verse 12, apply your heart to instruction, your ear to words of knowledge, and then we'll do saying Skip saying uh, 13, verses 13 and 14, and on to saying 14, which encompasses uh, verses 15 and 16. My son, if your heart is wise, my heart will be glad. And 16, this is such an interesting word. My inward parts you may have for your translation, my inward being will leap for joy, rejoice, celebrate when your lips speak what is right. And then saying number 15, which starts at verse 17, do not let your heart be envious of sinners. Be zealous, that's your King James, for the fear of the Lord. Verse 18, surely there will be there is a latter end, at your King James again, and your hope will not be cut off. We are going to skip saying 16, uh, verses 19 through 21. We've covered those proverbs similar on drunkards and gluttons. And so we come to saying 17, which encompasses verses 23, 22 through 25. Listen to your father who begets you, and do not despise, that's your New American Standard, your King James, your mother when she is old. 23, buy the truth, do not sell it, wisdom, instruction, insight. 24, the father of a righteous son has exaltation, and the one who begets a wise son rejoices in him. And finally, the end of saying 17, verse 25, let your father and mother rejoice and let the one who bore you shout in exaltation. Well, here is our first, verse 12 this morning the twelfth saying of the wise, apply your heart to instruction, your ear to words of knowledge. This is a proverb about the need to educate the young, and that's what we, in effect, have in all of these proverbs this morning, uh, these sayings. It's the education of the young child at home. That's the purpose of the book of Proverbs, home education in righteousness, delivered by the parents, and the parents pass it on to the children, and thus the links form from there. It is instructive in that these Proverbs are going to give us the positive as well as the negative regarding the child's education. So we open verse 12 with this word apply. Now that really rings in my ear because when I was a student, 
Professor Howard Hendricks would say to us students all the time, gentlemen, you're long on exhortation and short on application. And I've often thought about that. Uh, what does that mean? Um, I think he meant by that that we need to spend more time explaining and illustrating a text. <coughs> which makes this word apply front and center in our proverb. Because, surprise, surprise, we've had this word translated in all the English translations as apply. We've had it in numerous places and specifically in our own context here in Proverbs 23. Here it is. It's the widow's boundary in 23.10. Do not move the boundary stone. And here is our word. Go in. Enter in. That's the word that is translated in all the English translations to apply. You are not to enter into the property of the fatherless or the widow. And we covered that proverb because God is their overseer and protector. Divine providence on and over the life of the widow and the fatherless. So let me apply properly as I understand the word and as we want to understand this proverb. Not in the next meeting, which is the ministry of the word, but in the following meeting at the Lord's table. Invariably, Mark or one of the other elders are going to stand up at some point in that service and they're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he broke it, he gave thanks. Why, you can finish it. You've heard it so often. It's a part in your memory now. So, now that's the exhortation. Now we want to apply. We want to enter into what the exhortation or the instruction gave us. And here's how we do it. We partake of the elements. The very elements that he read about, we participate in. That's the word apply. We Enter in or we go in. That's the idea of the word. Apply. We take the elements based upon the instruction or the exhortation that he gave us. And we participate that way. I often say to young fathers, as God has given me the opportunity to have ministry to them. Look, don't read a book about prayer. No, you take your child and you put them right down next to you on your knees and you pray. That's teaching the child to pray and about prayer. That is applying. That is entering into the subject itself. Now, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 14. Uh, Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. Now that word come. It presupposes that the parents are bringing the child to him. So that's our apply. That's our application. How do we do that? I uh, have occasion to... Uh, drive my eight-year-old granddaughter, Palmer, uh, to places. Very infrequent, but I try to make the most of those times when we're together. And uh, rather than to give her a lot of instruction, I ask her questions. Um, and on one occasion, we're driving down the road and she blurts out, uh, Collins broke her wrist. Uh, she's got a cast. And she described the cast and the color of the cast. And 
And I go back and I tell these young guys that are fathers, that is a door big enough to drive a truck through. Take advantage of that. And here's how. You bring the Lord Jesus into their world, into their experience. You know, we're constantly instructing them about our world so that they can understand this grown-up world of ours. But we need to bring Jesus into their world. The things that are important to them, their observations, their feelings. And so we teach them by prayer. We talk to the Lord about this. You see, He's interested in their world, wherever it is. And you want to be the one that brings them and let Him build that relationship with them at a very early age. To learn to talk to Him and to depend upon Him. I would tell my children at an early age and all through my life, you're not going to always have me, but you're always going to have the Lord. And that's what's fundamental. And we want to focus on that relationship. It's the most important relationship of their entire being, of their lives. And we want to help them every way we can to build that time with Him together. Look, heart and ear, organs of the body, they are the gateway to the life, the inner life of that child. And what are we bringing them? We're bringing them words of knowledge. So how do we do that? I'm, I'm going all through this over again with my grandchildren. We color. We have big murals and we have these biblical stories and we color. I don't color. They color. I tell the story. But we color. We look at movies. We, we listen to Bible stories. We're pitching content. The knowledge of God. In every form available. We sing songs together. That is learning to build that relationship with content. And that's what we're interested in at Believer's Chapel. Building content. The knowledge of God. Why you believe what you believe. And therefore, it affects the way you behave. Now, we're going to see this application come back again and again in these Proverbs this morning. Verse 15, my son, if your heart is wise. This takes us back to 22.16, um, 22.6, uh, except uh, uh, train up a child in the way he will go. Now, you want to be the kind of parent that brings the child to Christ and you do not want to be the kind of parent that Isaac was in his old age that basically lived off his son. The gratification of his son is what brought him joy. We talked a little bit about Isaac last time. Genesis 27, 4, the old blind man said to his son Esau, make me savory food. Now, we looked at that word savory food last time. Verse 3, a savory food that I love that I might bless you. Look at the prid quo, quo there. The give for that. That's incorrect. And he wanted to bless the ungodly Esau, who he knew was not going to be the heir of the promises. So we learn something. When your children become the object of your own desires, you have lost the purpose for which God raised you up as a parent. 
You're to bring your children, your grandchildren to Christ. They are the fulfillment of His desires, not your own. Uh, Warren Duncan, back in 1979, brought me a whole library of reel-to-reel tapes of Donald Gray Barnhouse. I've told you this before. Barnhouse preaching in the 50s. And I listened to those messages over and over. What a masterful communicator he was. But there's one particular story that I have never forgotten. It's a story he told about John Brennan, known as Jack. Jack Kelly. John Brennan Kelly. He was a scholar. Rowboats. And he was an Olympic champion, both with the single boat and with his cousin Paul, the double boat. They were Olympic champions. They won everything. And uh, Jack went back to Philadelphia and became a millionaire in the construction business, bricks. He parlayed his, his athletic notoriety and he got tons of business. Jack had four children. One became the noted Grace Kelly of Hollywood, the actress. And she married and became royalty, the Princess of Monaco. Well, Jack had the money and Jack had the time. And so he went to England to compete in the regattas. But prior to World War II, the English had their view of a gentleman. And Jack wasn't. A gentleman, whatever that means. And so he wasn't allowed to compete. It was a humiliating loss to him. Made him very angry. And then the war came. And we were successful, the Allies. And then they informed Jack that they had a different definition of gentleman. And he was allowed to come back. Of course, he was too old by then. So he brought his son, Jack Jr., And he sailed. He beat them all. Beat them all. Crushed them. And Jack was so happy. He had showed those so-and-sos. And I remember Barnhouse saying, there's something obscene in all of that. I reminded my wife this past week. You know, it was 20 years ago. We were packing our son off to college, and he was going to participate as an athlete. And the summer before his senior year, we were in a lot of coaches' offices. And what struck me was it didn't matter where the school was, they all invariably talked the same story. They wanted to talk about Tiger Woods and golf. Back then, the turn of the century, why wouldn't they? I mean, he was the number one sports personality in the world. He was bigger than the game itself. You put him in a tournament, the TV cameras came and the crowds came. They talked about his focus, his competitive nature, his willingness to win at all costs. He was a driven man, and they so respected that. Of course they did. Earl did a great, great job of teaching him his son the skill of the game, didn't he? I mean, we loved him out there on the holes of golf, hitting those balls so far, making those putts in and out. We loved him on the course. But uh, invariably, the cameras turned off and the crowds went home and he left the clubhouse, but not to drive home. Uh, We all learned that too, didn't we? No, Earl, you did a great job of teaching your son the game, but not the real game, the big game, the game of life, the skill for living. Psalm 127, 
I don't need you to turn to it. You already know it. People from Believer's Chapel, Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, those who labor, labor in vain. You know that psalm. And the crescendo of the psalm is the last verse. Verse 5. He will not be put to shame when he contends or speaks with his enemies at the gate. Um, look at that profile. Let me read it again. He will not be put to shame when he speaks or contends with the enemies at the gate. You see, that is the final point of the assembly line of the child. From the house that the Lord built, here he comes. And look at him. He's at the gate. That's where the professionals meet. So he's a, an executive. He is an engineer, a banker, a lawyer, a real estate man. And he's out where decisions are made, where rules and laws are passed. He's a professional and he is speaking, contending with enemies. Now, who are the enemies? Well, those would be the people that deny his righteousness. And he's standing firm. I see a confident, bold child at the end of Psalm 127. And that's the product that we have the opportunity to fashion and mold together. At the end of speaking on Proverbs, one day an elderly gentleman, I consider myself elderly, this guy was elderly. And uh, he comes up to me and he said, do you have a proverb for a wayward child? And I said, no, not really, but I'd like to talk to you about that. And so we got together and he told me the story of the child that grew up and is now out of the home, but not living a righteous life, not according to the faith, doesn't want to be identified with the people of God or to hear the word of God. So I listened and uh, I said to him, well, first and foremost, you know that the greatest of all the brothers, Judah, was on a bender of rebellion, so to speak. Genesis chapter 38, he has this very circuitous route outside of the family, but the Lord brought him back. But here's the thing I want to really exhort you about, I told him. The Bible clearly teaches the reunification of families. And that's why he brought you to faith. Uh, that you would have a real dynamic effect upon your line, your children. There is reunions here. Okay, that would be a picture of Joseph being reunited with his brothers down in Egypt. Uh, it is a picture of Joseph being re reunited with his father, Jacob, coming to the edge of Egypt. Now remember that Joseph had been dead in the mind of his father for decades. Look at that picture of reunion there. So that's reunion here. But there's also reunion there. And the Bible clearly teaches that. John 14, the Lord said, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, place, the word is an abode. It's like uh, a giant place with lots of rooms. And it's the place where the family is reconnected through all generations. That's the idea. From the Old Testament, let me exhort you, I told him. We have that term, and he died and was gathered to his father. It carried to his father. Uh, it is, uh, it's the picture of the father going to be with his father, and his father, 
and his father all the way back to Abraham. And when Jesus gave the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, he referred to that very concept that they would go back to Abraham, Abram's bosom, his place. And that's the way the Old Testament saint thought about it. I'm going to be regathered to my family. And ultimately, that ends with Abraham who began the nation. So it's a constant refrain. So you have the reunification here, but you also have the reunion there. And there we have the story of David, his son with Bathsheba, and the Lord said, I'm going to take him. And David fasted and wept and prayed in agony day and night for the life of that child. And they told him the child is deceased. And remember David's words. He won't come to me, so I will go to him. Now, I told his father, look, you're the man of the word. Come to Bible studies. You seek the Lord with all your heart. You pray. You are the believer priest of your family and of your line. Nothing has really changed. Your child's out of the house, but nothing's really changed with you and your role. So you as the believer priest for your family, you continue to plead to the Lord. He loves your child even more than you do. And you, as the priest for the family, intercede on their behalf. And you do that even to the last breath you take in life. And you rest in that. God is the God of covenant loyalty. Hesed, remember? He is the one who does more than we could ever ask or think, right? That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in our prayers. So you trust Him. And you pray. And you vigilantly pray and wait. And that's the idea. So, remain calm. Be steadfast. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That is why you are in the providence that you're in. Here's 16. This is such an interesting word. My inward parts, your translation may read inward being, will leap for joy when your lips speak what is upright. Spontaneous joy at a time when the child's speech conforms to wisdom. So that's... Uh, the end of Psalm 127 when he's contending with his enemies at the gate. Mom and dad aren't around. Here he is. He's out. He's independent. He is fervent in doing what is right. And it creates spontaneous joy. This inward part is literally kidneys. Uh, something that we as Westerners don't relate to. But... That's the way it, emotions were talked about in the ancient Near East. Your kidneys. Now, totally contrary to our mind. Can you imagine sitting on Johnny Carson's couch and saying, Oh, Johnny, you're so funny, you make my kidneys jump. Why, he'd have a field day with a statement like that. It would carry his whole show. But that's the way they thought. And look... Here's your emotions. We'll leap for joy when they hear a full expression from the mouth. Look at the when. Very important word. A time, an occasion, a providence. That's the child speaking. Now look at this. What is upright? What is upright? That's the geometric notion of straight. Whether it's horizontal, whether it's vertical. Think of a laser. It is always straight. And what are they straight to? They're straight to the law, the Word of God, the Torah at the time. That's the idea. And here's 17. Don't let your heart be envious of sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the time. 
Notice we open with the negative. Do not. Envious. That's a passionate attitude. Hot. Excited. Envy. The root of all sorts of sins. That's Cain who killed his brother Abel. Let your heart be zealous. In this verb form, it's to be excited about. To be hot for the fear of the Lord. Exercised in your relationship to Him. You want to understand zealous? Go sit down with a brand new Christian. That'll give you a bath in zealous. Because a brand new Christian, you can't shut them up. They're so excited. They're so pleased. They're so full of the Lord saving them. I think sometimes that should be required of all of us at least one time a year. Here's 18. Certainly, surely, there's a latter end. Your hope will not be cut off. Now this goes back to our previous proverb about children. The word surely binds us to verse 17 and to our proverb here, which introduces a positive. Latter end is a reference to the end result of constantly fearing the Lord. Here's the end product of that. It is tied to your hope. You see that? Hope is a reference to the future. He regenerated your soul for a purpose. He has plans for you. He, his immutable counsels are all going to be tied to your tomorrows. And you don't know what those are. How often did we hear a person say, well, I couldn't really believe that my life took this turn and that I'm here before you now. We think about the apostles standing before the Sanhedrin. Who were they? They were just common fishermen. These weren't scholars. These weren't men educated. They were just commoners. Fishermen. But there they were in the providence of God, standing before the Supreme Court of Israel, bearing witness to Christ. What an unbelievable thing to think about. And you remember their response? When the Sanhedrin sits, no longer speak in this man's name. Remember what they said? We will obey God and not men. Now think with me for a moment. What could the religious leaders of Israel possibly say to a statement like that? We must be God and not men. Huh. He couldn't, they were confounded by these fishermen, these common, ordinary men, and they had no answer for them. And the apostles walked right out and back into the synagogue proclaiming Jesus Christ. Oh, my friends, you have no idea what he, his plans are for you and for your future. That's the latter end. I want you to look at this figure cut off. It comes, the word comes from Numbers 13 through 23. It's used of the spies in the promised land. It's a figure. They cut off. That's our word, a cluster of grapes, showing the abundance of the land of promise that God had provided for his people. And to cut that fruit from the tree or the vine, severed, what allowed that precious produce to be and remain powerful. Now, of course, that fits in perfectly with what you and I as believers know about our relationship to our Lord. John chapter 15. I'm the vine. You're the branches. He is the one who invigorates and makes powerful the lives of His saints. John 15, 5. If you remain in Me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. 
Our strength and our vitality come from Him and Him alone. Under His power, a tiny mustard seed becomes this great thing. Now you think about that. A snowy morning in London, a little small lad walks into a church. Here's a cobbler, because the pastor wasn't even there. A simple message. And Charles Spurgeon was born again. Who cares? Just a small figure in the world. Here's a German monk whose father wanted him to be a lawyer. What a great lawyer he would have been. That steel trap of German mind handling the legalese, but he went into the ministry. And God regenerated his soul, and the world is a better place because of one man, Martin Luther. How about John Calvin? A timid, weak young man, physically. He just wanted to be a scholar. He was going to be a scholar of the law. But God regenerated his soul. And that one single personality changed the Western Hemisphere up until today. The Institutes of the Christian Religion. John Calvin. The world dismisses one man. We rejoice in every one that God gives us. It's his power functioning in the life of one individual. Here's our last saying, saying 17. And it is composed of verses 22 through 25. Listen to your father who begets you, and do not show contempt for your mother when she grows old. We open with this top line in a command to listen. Now, my partner in crime here in this class who teaches the weeks I'm not here. I listen to him carefully and I take notes. I hope you take notes. July 24th, here is what he said, and I quote, How we listen tells us the condition of one's heart. Pretty profound thought. Particularly when we come to this proverb, the command to listen. Both parents emphasizing a figure. The figure is begot. And we think begot. Well, that would be the birth, right? No, it has a durative idea with the word. So think of it this way. I take a roll of paper and I throw it out. And it streams into the air. And we have all of this roll out in front of us. That's the word, begot. It encompasses from the moment you have life until the end. To never show contempt is to always follow the teaching of the family, the mother and the father. They're working as a team, you know, to perform this final product of the child. 2 Timothy 3. Here's the mark of the times. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, lovers of, the go- uh, lovers of pleasure, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, rather than Lovers of God. And I read that and I think, man, I'm so glad I'm not in those days. My goodness, that would be terrible, wouldn't it? You know, 40 years ago, I read the first volume of uh, Arnold Dallimore's uh, two-volume biography of George Whitfield. And I remember the opening chapter, about 60 pages, and it was the times in which God brought Whitfield into the world. I closed the book and I said, my gosh, that's not his times, that's our times. Oh my goodness, that's 
the way it is for us even today. Now, here's the remedy for it. Verse 23, buy the truth. Don't sell it. Wisdom, instruction, upright. That's for the times. It's the commercial content of exchange figures. Buying, selling, truth, reliability. It's to be obtained no matter what the cost. You know... I just had turned in my Romans paper to Dr. Edwin Bloom, and I stayed up all night finishing it. And I was to meet him for lunch because I wanted to talk about some of the finer points that he was going to uh, test us on in our final exam. And I can remember uh, he drove to the restaurant, and I was dozing because I'd been up all night. And somewhere in the middle of that lunch, he said to me, you know, I consider it to be the greatest thing of my life to be educated by people who taught me the Word of God. You know what's funny? That was 47, 48 years ago. I can't remember the exam. I can't remember my paper. I can't remember anything but that. And here's what I want to say. Edwin Bloom was one of the greatest teachers of my life, and I am so indebted to him because of his education and his proficiency to me. What a great man. Every dollar I spent on my education has come back to me a hundredfold. And I'm sure Mark could say the same. So here we are. Verse 24, the father of a righteous son shouts in exaltation. What is that? We have from the beginning of the book the constant exhortation for the child in the home to follow the parent's instruction, follow the Word of God, teaching of the father and the mother. And now here is the result. Look, the shout. We find that often in the worship of the people of God in the Old Testament. What are they doing in shouting? They are declaring the great things of the Lord. That's your children. That's the product that you're putting out into the world. And they shout for joy over the righteousness of a child. 25, let your father and mother rejoice and let the one who bore you shout in exaltation. The reinforcement of verse 24, the exuberance, the joy of the mother, the collaborative effort of instruction proves again that the work of the parents has been done and done well. Look what they've produced. They've produced an elder at Believer's Chapel a deacon at Believer's Chapel. Men that don't occupy space, but they are actually involved in their day-to-day -day with doing things that are eternal. And they pour upon us by their efforts and their prayers, goodness and mercy and joy and kindness overflowing. That's our work. That's the work of the parent. No, it's not in seeing the worldly success of your child. Oh, that's wonderful. But don't give that much light or water. The spiritual things are the things that last. And that's your nugget of gold. Keep it. Pray over it. Seek the Lord every day in it. And God will show you His power, His performance in your life. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you for these parents, these grandparents, these aunts and uncles that helped raise these children in the home, out of the home, Whatever be the case, may your 
hand of blessing be upon them in richness, in fullness. May your benediction of blessing rest upon the head of each and every one of these children that we have an opportunity to influence. May God show us His rich mercy by bringing them to faith either here or we will join them there for the activity that only you produce in a human life. We rejoice that the blessings and abundance is all from you. In Jesus' name, amen.